our, how we design our cities is so important and also how our cities are connected with each other around the world. And this next section is all about that. It's about the networks, the infrastructure, the digital connections. So please welcome Simon Waterfall. Simon is founder of Frey and also a trustee of the Design Council. Simon. Hello, everyone. It's a, it's a great honor to address such a wide, long, thin room and not to ignore the ends where I've sat for the last part. And hopefully we won't be heckled by any more brass bands. I don't know what my theme tune is, but it's definitely not a brass band. Um, I was reminded we're talking about our future world and we're sitting in an amazing historical building. And I was reminded of the quote that the history has a, has a good way of predicting the future. If you study your history, you'll most probably predict your future. And it reminded me of my first day at college when Professor Jeremy Myerson explained why we were here and why we were in the Royal College and what cultural event led to the formation of the college. And it was, one of the, it was the Great Exhibition, 1851. Thank you, Professor. Um, when, when they decided to show the world about our future worlds, our future cities, our future everything, I don't think they thought it would be an enormous success, but they laid it on, obviously built the palace, everybody came. We've built a few of these palaces over the years, from our Millennium Dome to even maybe our Olympics. They made a fortune. They made millions. It touched the heart of so many. And what could they suddenly do with all this money? So they decided in one part of the, the London city to actually build a futuristic city. So where you now know is the Royal College, the Royal School of Organists, the Royal Ballet, Imperial College. They, with all this money, they suddenly built this futuristic city. And it was nicknamed Albertopolis, which was Albert's vision of the future. I look at it now, and of course, it, it's, it's the old school. It once was the new school. And I think it's really important, especially as we sit here, to understand that kind of what makes, what makes Great Britain, what makes us British, you know, that diversity of our history and our heritage, but also the ability to catapult ourselves forward. So that solid base, that grounding, that cultural stability, I think that gives us somewhere for, to jump from. So my first day at the Royal College, obviously I was wearing ball gowns and wedding dresses, because everybody does, it's a Royal College. And the best tool I discovered in the whole building was the lift. Over two years, the best projects I did, the most interesting people I met, was getting on the lift and going into different floors. Because at each different floor, there was another world of experts. There was another world of people to engage with. And so what we've tried to do for this next panel is to get quite a few of those huge different floors involved. And we're going to talk about three consultants from three of Britain's most globally connected and export active and innovative firms. So it's important that we have our guides to shape that better world, who can make sense of our transportation networks, our digital connectivity, and also the in infrastructural opportunities and architecture that all arise from this process of mass globalization as we look to the new future global cities. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to also take lots more questions because we think we've been sitting down quite a lot. So please think questions, we'll take them from the floor. But I'd like to now introduce uh, my three speakers. And first of all, we have Paul Priestman from Priestman Good, uh, Tom Hume from IDEO, and Jeremy Watson from Arup. So please welcome to the stage. Now, I, I have met and known these, I'm a fan of most of all of your work, um, but Paul, you and I have known each other an enormously long time, um, from way back. Um, and some of the strength of your work, 
you talk about and you're very, very vocal about discussing is talking about for diverse cultures and diverse natures of cultures. We talk, we're sitting underneath the Union Jack flag here. But the Union Jack flag contains the raft of, of different cultures. Can you talk briefly how you use some of that as your strengths of design? Well, I suppose I've always believed that design is about making something better. And that, that's what makes me function. Um, all of our work, nor, nearly all of our work comes from overseas. So mostly export in, in, in the business. Um, we've also consciously, as a studio, not developed a house style. And it's based on good thinking. And that allows us to work with many, many different companies in the same discipline. And I think that's quite interesting because that allows us to develop as a business and also to then understand the brands and the various um, objects and vehicles that we're designing. So for instance, if we're working with Airbus or we're working with many of the different airlines, we're able to bring out their own unique imagery and style and functionality um, to develop their business. And I think that's quite unique to the UK in actually being able to develop that kind of thinking, but also allowing us to design for many, many different types of regions in the world. I mean, for instance, we've been designing some trains recently. Um, in, in the UK, we're, we're designing bike racks for trains. Um, in Australia recently, we were designing for surfboards, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, on Chinese trains, you need hot water freely available in every vestibule. And it's those sorts of things which I think are fascinating to, to design and get under the skin of. And then we are able to develop these products, these big moving products, um, which are absolutely right for that culture. And they become proud objects of a modern country which we're helping develop. And taking Airbus as an example, mm. designing a, a plane that is fit for purpose with all the engineering and the complexities yeah. of it, but the, the diversities of then a national airline to, be, to make that their own. Yeah. I, I remember sitting with the head of Singapore Airlines, um, and I sat with him for a week locked in a room judging some awards. And he said, do you know what the most important part of my job is? And I was like, make money, uh, don't kill the planet with aviation gas. He said, no, I've interviewed every single Singapore airline girl that we've ever employed. So I have actually met the man with the best job in the world, and it's not Johnny Ive, <laughs> it actually is the head of Singapore Airlines. And he said, the, the plane itself is just the stage for which the, she performs. The food with the best chefs is just literally the food that she is allowed to present you. And knowing that their brand, their cultural sensitivity of service is then performed on your work, yeah. you know, with, which is the point of the spear? How do you enable those people to perform at their very, very best? When designing a, an aircraft interior, um, when we start with an airline, the first thing we ask about is the service. Because if you're designing a, um, a seat, for instance, and you can work out that perhaps the, the unique selling point, hate that word, um, of this particular airline is to offer a bottle of water when you sit down. Um, if you design an object or a part where this bottle of water can sit within the chair, or in the environment you're designing, then it will be put in that place. But if you don't actually have any of those facilities as you're developing the, the seat, for instance, then the service crew will not be able to maintain that kind of service and it will disappear. So it's, it's two things. You're trying to help the service, the crew, to perform well and make it easy for them, but also then to develop a good service back to customers. So it's an interesting area. I remember sitting on the Airbus when it first launched and watching Star Trek, the new Star Trek, which you haven't seen, is brilliant. And from going from a Boeing to an Airbus, it's, it's the small things, it's the sounds, it's the size of the windows, it's things that you never thought would change. And suddenly I'm watching Star Trek, and I look up, and I'm actually in a spaceship, and it's completely new to me. And again, that ability to see with fresh eyes. Yeah. How do you keep that freshness? Well, we're always looking for, for new innovations, new materials. Um, I mean, the, designing in the aviation sector is fascinating because it is the most rigorous. As a designer, it frustrates the hell out of me if I go to a, um, a hotel and um, the light doesn't work, you can't read in the bed. You just couldn't do that in an aeroplane. 
you know, if, if something becomes damaged on an aircraft, the aircraft might not be able to take off. So it's a fantastic discipline for designers because it is so rigorous. It has to work. Um, you know, if, if, if your seat rattles in mid-flight, you think the wings are going to fall off. So, I mean, there are things, the responsibilities that you have to have. And um, it's a wonderful area to work in, but constantly innovating, looking at new materials, reducing weight, which is the big issue. You know, I think in years to come, the idea of tra traveling across the Atlantic with a, a glass bottle of wine in your hand may be seen as ridiculous in the future. Um, and these are interesting times, but they will change. But that's what's so fantastic also, working in high-speed rail, trying to encourage people to get out of their cars and use more of the infrastructure that's available. And as a designer, designing trains to planes, the impact in the environment is obviously a tenth between the two of them. How do we encourage them to take some of the right steps? Um, well, when we started working with uh, Virgin Atlantic on the, on the um, Virgin Rail with the, the first trains, um, you know, one of the briefs was to try and get people out of their cars. And I think you just have to analyse why do people want to go in cars. Um, so you want to try and increase the personal space. Um, you then bring out all of the advantages of being able to get up and go to a restaurant halfway through your, your journey, rather than stopping on the motorway or being strapped in on an aircraft. Um, so you just bring all of those elements out. But privacy is number one. Um, and you know, I, I do think that, that short-haul air travel will, will slowly disappear, I hope. Um, but um, you know, it's, it's the job of designers to make that more appealing. And I think that's a, it's a fantastic opportunity. And certainly some of the developments in, in overseas where um, the trains are so sophisticated, so fast, uh, vast. You know, the trains we're designing in China are over half a kilometer, a kilometer long. Um, and travel at very, very high speeds. And uh, I think there's, uh, you know, if we can encourage billions of people to use the train rather than the car, then I think it's, it's going in the right direction. Um, uh, unfortunately, Richard Seymour, who's unfortunately ill from the last uh, speech, he talks about standing waves a lot, which is when something hasn't changed for an enormous amount of time. And I can remember first going to Japan and seeing a Japanese train, as you said, just in, in, incredible speed and, yeah. you know, it gave me a whole new outlook on what a train could be. But then I got off the train, and because I was so in love with it, obviously just stared at it like a little boy rubbing my thighs, going, this is a great train. And I've just come from uh, the major city to Kyoto, and everybody else had left, and suddenly they pressed one button, and all the seats in the train turned around in the carriage and faced the other way to make the return journey. And at that point, my jaw pretty much like Thomas Heatherwick's cauldron dropped down and back, you know, which is to st staggeringly st stupefying. I could not, why doesn't my train, why doesn't my seat turn around? Because I get sick traveling backwards. It's like, how do you find those moments of just, that's ridiculous. And, and culturally, it's, it's just not acceptable um, to travel backwards. Um, so um, in, in, in other parts of the world, so you have to be able to rotate the seats. But I mean, the latest seats we're doing on the high-speed trains in China are actually full, flat, reclining seats that go into beds, and those also rotate. And that's, you know, it's, a it's really... A rotating bed? It's, it rotates it's in the direction of travel. Right. Right. Okay. And it's goes into a full powers. bed. No, it's so not. That's no, no. another cultural identity. No, no we're not going to... Um, Tom, IDEO. Um, you and I share you know, very common DNA, um, and something that we were talking about earlier is the enormous speed of change that you and your colleagues have to deal with. Um, digital and technology, as we always say, is measured in dog years. It's, it's multiples of seven compared to maybe the time it takes for a train to be designed or the ability to, to change the train design. How do you and your, your colleagues keep up? I think the first thing we try and embrace is diversity. So we've heard a lot. In fact, the opening ceremony of the Olympics reminded me of this. Um, the Industrial Revolution created it's sort of an outcome of bringing together these diverse people for the first time ever. It was an explosion in creativity. That's a function of bringing diverse people together, I think. New thoughts, new ideas, new conversations, and giving them oxygen to think of new things. Now, digital is interesting to me. It's interesting in terms of the sort of fundamentals, the platforms, but actually it's most interesting as a tool to drive that diversity, to drive that creativity. So we turn to digital a lot, and the way we find the diversity is through 
platforms like OpenIDEO where we bring together people from over 160 countries to try and solve problems together, but also just by being a global business, we probably find in a very rudimentary tech five or ten emails per day asking for advice from people around the firm that what they're seeing locally, what's happening locally. But if, as IDEO Lab, if you open the lab to your clients, the, the step change between what's kept within your walls of your studio and the speed and the, the, the frenetic pace that that takes, how do you make sure that that's then translated to your clients who, as we heard last time, you know, a very pointed brief gives you the right focus, but if you showed them the breadth of your thinking, could you possibly scare them away? Because it is an incredibly fast-moving place. I mean, first and foremost, we offer experiences, and I think the best way of helping our clients build the muscle to be more flexible, more adaptive, it's often actually through the lens of technology because I think technology is sometimes a forcing function. It forces them to think in that accelerated time frame. We, you know, when Moore's Law, the idea that the number of microprocessors you could put affordably on a circuit board doubled every couple of years, we thought that was going to be finished by now. People predicted that actually it would be linear again. But if anything, as we discussed before, it's accelerating. You know, the number, yeah. I, just sort of an inspiring example that the iPhone 4S has more processing power than the whole of NASA when they put a man on the moon. <laughs> now, that fundamentally to me is giving everyone access to that processing power. So instead of needing, you know, 77 like Macs in 1984, we can handle that processing with an iPhone. People have access. There's more smartphones being registered per day than there are babies born. This increase and in sort of technology just pushing out there actually is, I think, helping us help our clients develop these new behaviours. And ironically, sometimes it's in their personal lives, they're seeing the effect of it. And then we, through that lens, will help them in, kind of embed it and onboard it into their business. But the technology itself is, is just a tool. It's like we try to stay agnostic to what the vehicle is, what the tool is. We're fundamentally, as Thomas described, just solving big challenges. And I think much of the value we bring is challenging the question itself staying agnostic to how we, salute it, uh, how we solve it, but trying to make great experiences, whatever that takes. I remember visiting the, uh, the NASA space sten station, or the station? station. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was in space the other day, and uh, they had the backup computer for the Apollo program. So if everything went slightly crazy, what's the backup computer? And it was a calculator. It was a battery-powered 2AA's calculator. And so they still had the skills to get them out. You know, the Apollo 13, oh my god, we've got to fix this. They still had the skills to put the numbers in and get them home. Do you think if you provide, you know, faster processes, you know, unlimited Moore's laws coming from 18 months down to 12 months, do you think that also makes people lazy in terms of their coding and the processing power? I, I, I think core skills change, the retention of information um, becomes less important because we all have access to the data at our fingertips, but also our ability to act and launch things to learn is also with us like it's never been before. You know, I'm excited, actually, you know, if you compare NASA's use of the similar processing, it's, I believe, fundamentally, we as human beings want to use that kind of access for more than just firing you know, angry birds at pigs. It's going to be, there's more, instead, more important stuff that can be done with it. Well, you say you do this, but then I will look at Wikipedia's 22 million articles that people have contributed, people from all over the world. There's 35 million users of that site. And I see it as a beautiful reflection of the fact that we want to do more. You know, people predicted that Encarta would be the most successful um, encyclopedia, it wasn't. And it's because technology is enabling us to do new stuff. It enables us to participate. It enables us to self-actualize the top of Maslow's hierarchy. And I really would expect that to continue. I think the amazing thing as well to me is actually, in many ways, atoms are kind of following bits. It's something that David Rowan at Wired has talked about before. It's fascinating when you look at the trend towards 3D printing and the fact that we all can become creators. I think it 
can be incredibly empowering. There's always going to be counterexamples, but if we look at that bleeding edge of mass participation, mass creativity, I think it can only be a good thing. I'm, I'm drawn to when Wikipedia was first started, when you, you went onto it. It wasn't the, the font of all knowledge, it was the font of all bullshit and lies. So I can remember famous politicians being quoted as saying all sorts, everybody jumped onto it because you could input the data yourself. It, it gave the whole population for the first time the chance to abuse it. And now you go to Wikipedia because it, its abuse has dropped away because now it's the place with no spin. Well, well I, think the, I think people are fundamentally good. You know, there's exceptions, but... So on OpenIDEO, which we found, we have now 36,000 people contributing to solve challenges for social good, and we've never had to take down a post. Not once has there been an abusive post, and I think that's because we all collectively get better at designing for loss of control. You know, sticking on the Apple theme, I think one of the most inspiring things for me that Apple has done is actually it's created a blank canvas for human creativity. We are all able to contribute apps to the environment. We're all able to, you know, imagine that it might be a spirit level, it might be a new way of paying for a taxi. It may, all of these things, they're, you know, they're creativity that happened outside the building, but they're embraced, and then cleverly they include some constraints in the system, which I think is important. When you have this process of mass proliferation where everyone is contributing to everything, there need to be some constraints. So the UX guidelines are a way of constraining it and make it feel like a comfortable environment to be creative. It being a, when you say a blank canvas or the ability to, to play yourself, I think the worst piece of, the worst brief I can get is when people say it's blue sky. You can do anything you like. And you die instantly, it's like, tell me a joke, and suddenly you go completely blank. And a great comedian said, you know, with the invention of Google Maps, you can, you know, the Google Earth, you can search anywhere in the world, you can look down nearly any street, you can go to the moon, you can go to the Scots Antarctic hut. What's the first place you look at? Your street, your front door. And it's like, because you can't remember anywhere else you've been in the world. But yeah, but we, we kind of all get over that pretty quickly. If you look at, I think so much of what we need to do in this fast changing world becomes react quickly to environments. So Google Maps, we see everywhere at the moment. It wasn't released as an API. It wasn't released as something where they said, go on, have a go. Yeah. People reverse engineered it. And then they thought, actually, we want to encourage this sort of, you know, the, the bubbling up of new use cases. And now I think it's on 350,000 different web services use Google Maps off the top of my head. It's the biggest API globally. So I kind of, ag I completely agree with you about the blue sky thing, but maybe for marginally different reasons. My worry when people say to me, oh, we, you know, it's a blue sky, there's twofold. The first is, it, doesn't sort of demonstrate any sense of urgency or desire to actually do anything. If you just say, oh, we want to we wanna do something new, if there's no real purpose, if there's no ability to define what good looks like in the future, if there's no, then you'll never hold anyone to account. And actually, probably it'll just end up being a concept car. It'll just end up being, you know, a superficial sort of skin that's put over something rather than something that really changes the DNA of the organization. So if it is, the blue sky brief. I hope that it's sort of coupled with a burning platform or some other reason to really change. I think when you talk about 3D printing, what's the first thing you're going to print? I, I'm, I did it, so I have to admit, I, the first thing I 3D printed was my name in different colours with different fonts. Like a complete waste of energy, <laughs> space and time, but I got over that pretty quickly. Um, and now we're doing some much more interesting stuff, luckily. OK, I think I still need to get through that part. It's good fun. <laughs> All right. um, Jeremy, um, back in back of the millennium, there was a fantastic piece of work that said we were doing three of the zones for the, the Millennium Dome. And we said, what makes us British? What's, you know, we're talking about Great Britain. What makes us British? And they did, I can't remember who actually did the work, they came up with the most fundamental definition of what I believe defines us. And it was called the andscape. So the andscape, and they said, as, as, as royalists as we are, 
If you find the most devout royalists from the weddings and the diamond, you'll also find anarchists. As high-end fashion as we, as we are, you'll also find street fashion. And what makes us great is that fulcrum, that landscape is right in the middle. And Arab, for me, as you know, I'm the biggest fanboy of your work, is the ability to put engineering and architecture right on that fulcrum and to push it as far, far out as you possibly can, which I think defines you and also it's, it's, it's the thing that challenges you. So you talk briefly about that and your, your working process. Well, thank you very much for that. I mean, it's a tribute to Arab. I think you could say we're a, a benevolent anarchy, if you like, the way we work. We, people are enabled within Arab through the culture to enjoy their work and to be as creative as possible. I was amazed when I first joined Arab six years ago. I worked for a very notable public company in the UK, and I'd enjoyed myself greatly there. But when I got to Arab, I thought, gosh, the only restriction in this company is myself. It's only my limitations that are going to limit my development and growth in the company. And I think a lot of people feel that way, and from the new graduate intake right the way through to the managers and directors, we try and follow that. So how do we create the culture? Well, we do a great deal of collaboration. Uh, we join up design with engineering. We enjoy working very closely with our architect partners, and we've heard two of them this morning, in fact, on some of the keynote projects. We enjoy innovation, taking concepts through to implementation, creating something from that volitional thought into reality. And I think, uh, uh, again, a previous speaker mentioned that, you know, that maybe it was Jonathan, Johnny Ive, uh, you know, the, the, the joy of, of getting something real out of an idea. You know, one minute you didn't have the idea. And when the idea is a building or a city, fantastic, absolutely amazing. And we try and feed back that satisfaction to our people to motivate them and to record, to celebrate, you know, we've got a kind of living history which we can access over the internet. With respect to fostering the culture, and I'm research director at Arab, so very, very interested in partnering around the world uh, with the best universities anywhere in the world through our multinational activity, which we operate out of our 90 or so offices. When we do a project, we do it multinationally. So although there may be a core team in the country where the particular project's being delivered, we'll tap into specialist effort from all around the world. So there's this feeling of extended team. And I'm continually impressed by the inward investment, the ongoing investment in tools to make that happen. So our intranet is very capable. We can share project work. Increasingly, we're looking to a more permeable boundary around Arab. We're looking to share with universities and with other companies through open workspaces to, to do that activity. And then more formally, we, we do design schools. So we, we set people challenges uh, in an office. We'll, we'll do a one or two day event. Uh, we'll come up with as wacky ideas as we can. We'll try and test them. We do simulation, visualization. Uh, and we leave people with a good feeling that it's OK to spend time just thinking about new things and not constantly working on projects, but taking the, those ideas forward. And over the last, I think, three years, we've formalized that a little bit through, um, it's a bit of a hackneyed phrase, isn't it, company universities. But we have a, an Arab university which both delivers continuing professional development, master's modules of which design and, and, and computer-aided design are part, but also a doctoral program which is run in conjunction with UCL, which delivers full doctorates with a full street value. And we've got a dozen people doing that. Around the world, we've got about 55 uh, doctorates going on at any one time and 150 research projects. Um, I mean, I, I describe myself now as a generalist, and I always thought that was my skill to translate and defend creativity through all these boundaries. I now think I'm getting very quickly out of my depth, and I'm obviously the specialist that you employ and finding those specialists. The most important part is how to link those people together and getting them all focused on exactly one particular problem, rather than, you know, as I know, how many problems and briefs you have at one time in the uh, company is absolutely vast. How do you keep that focus of those specialists? Yeah, well, I think there are, there are two answers that one can give to that. One is to have a point of focus, and we've tried to use a road mapping technique to collect from around the world what the business leaders think are important topics under the main, main sort of drivers and trends, uh, like the aging demography, climate change, adaptation, and so on. What do those things actually mean for what Arab can do to make a better world? So we try and interpret those into layers of activity against time. And out of those layers of activity, we look for where the gaps are in our capability and where the gaps are 
in international knowledge. And where those gaps are, we try and fund research. So we have a kind of coordinated way. We've, over the last four years, shared that around the world, and we focus our research funding into those areas. Um, and then I think the individual uh, centers, if you like, of research uh, are matched with Arab offices. So where the universities are working, we, we will work with them in whichever country or region around the world. So I think there's another angle to that question. Do you want to just... You've answered both of them well. Okay. <laughs> um, that's a good point. Questions. We're very, very quickly running out of time. We've got about five, six minutes. And we'd love to take some, some questions from the floor. Would anybody be brave enough to please ask us a question? We will not leave for lunch until... Thank you. Excuse me. My name is Rosemary Johnston. I come from Australia, University in Australia. Um, I've been really interested, the last um, speaker mentioned um, collaboration with universities and, and so on, but I've been waiting for some talk about schools because it seems to me that um, schools are caught in a paradigm that is a, a long ago paradigm and that we need to be looking at new ways of doing school, new ways of designing for school. And I'd like any, any comments. Sorry, I got nervous. I don't know why. <laughs> it's Australia. <laughs> I think we can all yeah. have a go at that. But Jeremy, would you like to start? Well, I guess uh, as a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering, I'm, I'm certainly aware that it's very much on our agenda in the UK. And also the engineering institutes and institutions have been very active in trying to, to get you know, engineering ambassadors out into schools. I think there's a real problem, I mean, looking particularly in the sort of technical end, the design and engineering end in the UK, of, of getting follow through. You need funding to train the teachers. Teachers aren't necessarily confident to carry through you know, the exciting stuff that maybe one or two engineers can bring into the classroom. You need then continuity. Uh, and, and we're lacking at the moment in, in, in a little bit of that, I think couple of areas that have inspired me. We've done some work in South America around private schooling, affordable private schooling, and then actually I think they're going to become an inspiration to all of us because they're not, they're sort of almost unencumbered by the infrastructural challenges that we see. So I've been inspired to see some of that work. And the other space that I think is really interesting, it's amazing how undisrupted schooling and secondary education has been by actually technology itself and there's some wonderful startups we tend to try and sort of scan the horizon for startups in any sector we're working and there's some great stuff like Coursera which humanizes the classroom at huge scale with technology and totally changes the model whereas instead of charging for the actual course itself you charge to receive the certificate at the end which I think is an interesting disruption that technology will unlock and there's a few others in that world that I think maybe the adjacencies to the classroom will be where kids will have the opportunity to really shine. Coding is another, there's amazing, you know, we, we see, we know how important coding is globally. The schooling system is lagging horrifically, but then there's all sorts of interesting businesses like Code Academy and a startup that's based in London as well called General Assembly that are actually helping relatively young kids often sort of develop these additional adjacent skills. Paul and Jeremy. Um, I, I always think it's just interesting that um, you see a two or three year old and they're all designers and artists because they can do anything. And what happens to it? You know, why, why, do, why does any of the people in this room end up doing design? I think it's, it'd be great if it was a more generalist sort of training of, of creativity and design because it's, it's a great background for any industry. Uh, and creativity is very important in so many things we do. So I think that's a challenge. I think it's brought back to the, the classical way of, of teaching design is, is, is to copy and give everyone a single grounding as they do in Italy and then you specialise afterwards but you then have this fantastic fluid language when an architect can freely speak to an engineer and a product designer and a vehicle designer because we're fundamentally, if we're designing a future world, what we're designing are just props within a much, much bigger picture and they have to join up, they have to link up. I think that's what's happening and so fascinating over the last two decades. It's not in isolation anymore. Vehicle design is not in isolation from, in, from interface design, which is, not in, which is not in isolation from its brand and its behaviour and how it communicates online. You know, suddenly a brand owner or a manufacturer is faced with 
so many different problems. And is he driving his design partners to link up, or do they already sit in the same space, on the same stage, speaking the same language? I just briefly wanted to touch upon something I think is very exciting about an emerging trend. Um, historically, over the years, engineering was something that people could have a hobby in, so kids would play with Meccano and construction kits and so on. In electronics, people could build components and systems, and then with the end of the BBC Micro came, people could still code. And we got into a world that's just too complex to do that with, and I think there's just emerging now the ability to buy pieces of kit off the shelf which kids can code, admittedly in the later years at school, and Raspberry Pi is an example. So something that's come out really of the world of Apple is now accessible for people through open source platforms to start to get into that high tech world and realize there is something they can do and make a career from. That's maybe because we all had Meccano and Tech. We did, Lego, so absolutely. we're all gonna say the same thing, <laughs> but the, the rise of the maker society out there the ability to, as you say, hack into an API that was, you know, you couldn't have done in the past, but just use it as Lego bricks. That's the APIs built like that. A piece of work that my old company at Poke did when, when tweeting was very, very basic. Nobody was actually doing anything with it rather than this is what I'm eating. Um, we, we lived, our, our office was right next to the Albion, uh, which is Conran's beautiful restaurant. And they had this fantastic oven that made the best pastries, best Danish, the best croissants. But we never managed to get down there in time because we were four stories up. So we built them an Arduino box. It's called the Baker Tweet. And it's got a great big aluminium knob on the front that a baker with flour on his hands can just kind of grab and twist. And he twists like, I've just made yeah, Danish pastries. Pushed it. And it would send a tweet out to anybody who was following them that the pastries are now hot and ready. And we thought this was brilliant. Yeah, it's fantastic. And some guy then just took our work and he went, well, I've never liked pastries. I only like their bread. And I only want to get their bread when I'm five minutes walking distance on from it. So let me hack in. The, it was actually Microsoft's mapping. So, oh, so now only give me the tweet when I'm within walking distance and it's bread and then send it me. And we were like, he's so much better than us. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that little <laughs> twinkle in his eye. I, first of all, I'd like to thank my fantastic panel and thank you for, for listening and our one question from Australia. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I think tweeting about food and what's coming out the oven is a very appropriate thing, a very appropriate moment to finish off on because the connections are not just uh, about what design can connect, it's the connections that we can all make today. I think it's been a great pleasure and a real privilege actually to hear so many great designers uh, telling us how they've gone about it. Um, there's a lot of people I know here who are interested in meeting each other, meeting some of the people they've heard and, uh, and having conversations and that's what we're here for. So please do join us now in the pavilion where lunch is served. But before we do so, um, a round of applause, not just for this panel, but for all our speakers. Thank you very much.